We are in 3 John. Tonight's sermon is entitled The Hall of Shame. I don't know if those words might be harsh, but we'll explain that as we go through the sermon. A defining characteristic of a sinful heart is pride. Proverbs 21.4 says, A haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing, or the lamp of the wicked, are sin. A prideful heart characterizes people that have sinned in their life. Tonight I want you to have your Bibles, and we're going to begin in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy. I'm going to ask you to try to come along with me as we examine pride in people's hearts, because when we continue in 3 John, we will be examining one who is very prideful. If you would first look up Deuteronomy 8.14, and I think the, the scriptures are on the bottom of your outline. If you have an outline, there should be more available if you don't. But Deuteronomy... 8.14 says when your heart is lifted up and that's a phrase in the Hebrew that simply means when you have pride upon or within yourself and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage pride causes people to forget God. Hosea, if you look, turn your Bibles to Hosea. I'd also like to make tonight's sermon interactive. If you have any comments or thoughts as we go along, please uh, let me know. Hosea 13, 6. Once again, pride causes people to forget God. Hosea 13, 6. When they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled in their heart was exalted, therefore they forgot me, me being God. So one characteristic, one uh, result of a prideful heart is to forget God. Another is that pride causes us to be unfaithful to God, if you would turn to Second Chronicles. Next two references will both be in Second Chronicles. The first one is in 26.16. And it says, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord, his God, by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar. Unfaithfulness to God. Again, in Second Chronicles. Another thing that pride causes us is to be ungrateful to God. In Second Chronicles, thirty-two, <coughs> verses twenty-four and twenty-five, it says, "In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to Him." and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him. In other words, he was ungrateful. For his heart, again, was lifted up. Therefore wrath was looming over him, and over Judah, and over Jerusalem. Scripture actually teaches that the emotion of pride, the feeling of pride, is in fact an abomination to God. Proverbs 16.5 Proverbs 16.5 it says, Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. After all, let us remember that it was through pride that sin 
in reality entered the universe. When Satan sought to exalt himself above God. So tonight we're going to take a little primer on pride as it is reflected in the Word of God. As with the case with the devil, pride drives people to seek to exalt themselves above other people. There have always been proud, egotistical, self-promoting people who try to usurp the authority of others, seize a place of preeminence, and elevate themselves into positions of power, positions of influence, positions of prominence. Scripture records many such people, and as I said, these folks kind of form a hall of shame in contrast to the heroes of the faith that are listed in Hebrews 11. The history of human pride, as we know, starts in the Garden of Eden. As it had been in Satan's fall, pride was a major contributor in the act of disobedience that catapulted the human race into sin. Eve ate the forbidden fruit, in part because she believed Satan's lie that would make her wise like God. Turn your Bibles to Genesis We will see the words of Satan, Genesis, Genesis 3, 5 through 6, simply says, in verse 4, we'll go back, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, in verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God by the evil one to Eve's desire to Eve's sense of pride and then he continues knowing good and evil and then in verse 6 so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise she took of its fruit and ate she also gave to her, her husband with her which means he was there he also, she also gave to her husband with her, and he didn't protest. He didn't correct. What did he do? He ate. Because he too had a prideful heart. So we know that pride has been at work amongst humankind since the very moment that sin entered humanity. In the next chapter of Genesis, we are introduced to Lamech. Lamech, who is a descendant of the first murderer, Cain. Like his ancestor, Lamech is also a murderer. He is also the world's first recorded polygamist. Until that time, there was no polygamy in the world until Lamech decided it was a good idea. As Cain's murder had been moved, motivated by what I'll call proud envy, Lamech's killings were a result of his pride. Listen to his words in what really is the first recorded poetry. It's written in a Hebrew prose form in Genesis 4, 23 and 24. This is a poem, and he wrote, Then Lamech said to his wives, Adon Zillah, Hear my voice, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy seven. Lamech was proud of his ability to kill a younger man who had, he had been in an altercation. Those are the words of a proud man. Genesis 10 and 11 relate the story of Nimrod. Nimrod is another proud figure who self-describes himself in Genesis 10 
He says he is a mighty one on the earth. His name is reflected in Hebrew has the connotation of being one to rebel. While the word translated mighty one refers to someone who magnifies himself and acts proudly or tyrannical in nature. In other words, he is the rebel who is mighty and rules with tyranny. The description of Nimrod as a renowned hunter not only refers to his ability to uh, hunt wild game, it also refers to his ability to hunt people and place them under slavery. We know that under Nimrod's uh, leadership, the Tower of Babel was built, which really, when you think of it, is nothing more than a monument to human pride and to rebellion against God. Now, Nimrod was also the founder of what later became the Babylonian and the Assyrian empires. Derek Kinder, whose historian writes concerning the character of Nimrod, he says, Nimrod looks out of antiquity as the first of the great men that are on the earth. He continues, he is remembered for two things that the world admires. Personal promise and political power. Now in Christian circles, we may not think very highly of Nimrod, but that is not a sentiment that is agreed upon in the world. In the Arab world, Nimrod is seen as a great man and as a great leader. And there are, in fact, cults built around his worship in the Arab world. Turn now to the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus 10, we see during Israel's wilderness wandering in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, that it says, Then Nadab and Ibihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it. They put incense on it and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. These two priests, they are priests, sons of Aaron, in their first priestly act, violated, in some unspecified way, the divine prescription for offering incense. Their behavior, some people would attribute to being drunk, re reveals their rebellious carelessness, their irreverence, and their preference for one thing, their way. One thing that we always attempted to stress at Clovis Christian Schools is that just because it's your idea doesn't mean that it's a better idea. The best ideas are God's ideas. But here we have two gentlemen, two young men, that decided that they had a better idea, and because of their proud independence, they pay the ultimate price. Also, continuing on, turn to Numbers, in Numbers 12. In Numbers 12, we see during the wilderness wandering, Moses' own brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, who sought to elevate themselves to the level of Moses. Numbers 12 states in the first verse through the third verse, then Miriam and Aaron, it says, spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. They bad-mouthed him because he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said in verse so they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard what they were saying. And it has in parentheses, in my version, in verse 3. 
Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth, an expression of who of Moses' heart. And then if you continue on in verse 4, see the Lord takes this idea of pride, this idea of arrogance, this idea of presumption, very seriously. Reading in verses 4 through 15, Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three. Can you imagine hearing that? God telling you, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. He's calling them to the, uh, to the temple, to the, the, uh, the enclosure where he resides. So the three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. And about then, Moses is probably thinking, okay, well, that's not me. Then he said, hear now my words. The Lord, the God wanted, our God wanted Moses there to hear these words. He says, in verse 6, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my, Moses, my servant Moses. In other words, he says, you are prophet. I have spoken to you, and they were correct that he had spoken to and through them. But not so. I don't speak this way to my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house, referring to the nation Israel. I speak with him, how? Face face. That literally means eyeball to eyeball in the Hebrew. And he says, he continues, even plainly and not in dark sayings, he's not, he doesn't speak to him in riddles. And, I, and he sees the form of the Lord Moses gets an idea of who he's speaking with. He doesn't see everything. This is pretty interesting how God describes his conversations with Moses. Why then were you not afraid to why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? In other words, you should have been afraid. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, Suddenly, Miriam became leprous, and she became white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was. She was now a leper. God took their presumption very, very seriously in verse 11. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly, in which we have sinned. Do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. In other words, her skin looked like that of an infant as it leaves the mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. And then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had not spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Which is a uh, of reference to, to uh, Levitical law. If her father spit in her face because of her indiscretion, she would have been put out of the camp for seven days. In other words, God's saying, at least that's the very least that should happen to her. And then he goes on, let us shut her out of the camp seven days, and afterwards she may be received again. So she's shut out for seven days, and the people don't journey anywhere. Everybody knows what Marion did because they're not journeying anywhere. They're waiting for her for seven days. They can't leave until she's brought in again. God, our Lord, takes pride very seriously. The problem with modern day society, especially in the church, is we give this idea of pride a lot of lip service. But I don't think we're always sold on the importance of keeping pride out of our lives. Pride is what brings down most pastors to fall. Be it pride of uh, self, pride over money, 
pride over sex, those pastors find themselves brought down by a sense of their own self-importance. So we need to be observant of pride in our lives. During the lawless days of the judges, Abimelech, the son of Gideon, wanted to be king, turn to Judges 9. He had such a lust for the power to be king that he murdered 70 of his brothers in an attempt to eliminate all of his possible rivals. But Abimelech's reign came to an untimely and what it, in, the, in the context it is written, very embarrassing end. During the siege of this, the city Thebas, it says in Judges 9, if you look at verses 53 and 54, it says, but a certain woman, a woman, that's bad news. It is. I'm sorry. And you'll see why it's bad news. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man who was his armor bearer that carried his shield and his sword so that he wouldn't have to carry it only, he only used it when necessary. And he told his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me, lest men, even at the point of death, Abimelech is still full of pride, he says, kill me, because if you don't, men will say, a woman killed me. That's how prideful he was. So the young man did as he was told by the king. He thrust him through with the sword and he died. That's being prideful. He was very, very dangerous. Absalom. Absalom's quest for power and prominence led him to stage a coup against his very own father, King David. His day in the sun was short-lived, and Absalom met a pretty terrible death when he was fleeing from David's men through a very dense forest. Absalom was noted for one particular part of his physical appearance. He had self-professed, which I once had, self-professed, beautiful, flowing hair. I once had beautiful, flowing hair. I'll show you some pictures. Many years ago. And as he was, pardon me, Doug too, Doug had beautiful, flowing hair, I can tell. Jean, Jean had beautiful. But as Absalom was riding through a dense forest, his mule that he was riding went under an oak tree, and his beautiful flowing hair became entangled in the tree's branches, and the mule kept going, and Absalom did it. And he was left hanging helplessly in midair. Soon, he was executed by David's general. Wow, God takes pride, self exaltation very seriously. David had another son that we're familiar with, and an Adjah, who also sought after his father's throne. David had a lot of problems. He lived, the sin in his life had a lot of consequences. The one thing about uh, David's reign, it was very, very interesting. I, I did a uh, a paper on David's life. He had, he had a most interesting life. And during the waning days of his life, if you look at 1 Kings, in the first chapter of 1 Kings, in the first, in the fifth verse, it says, Then Adonijah, the son of Hagath, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run down 
He's, and this is the exact same thing that the brother Absalom had done. They have 50 men to run before them, exalting who is behind. Here comes the great one, Adonijah. And that's at the very, as I said, his brother had done that. And in his attempt, his attempt, Adonijah's attempt to take over the throne was thwarted by Nathan. Still, Adonijah, a prideful man, was a slow learner. And he was pardoned by King Solomon. And he repaid King Solomon's kindness by attempting to overthrow King Solomon. And King Solomon, the second time around, being a wise man, ended the threat from Adonijah, and he had him executed. Second Chronicles, again, 26, 16, which I quoted in the very first portion of this sermon, talks about King Uzziah, Uzziah who attempted to usurp the functions of the, his priests. Second Chronicles 26, 16, he says, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. He had high self-esteem. That's one of those phrases that drives me crazy. They have such poor, my child has such poor self-esteem. Mr. Materials, and that's why they have all these problems. The real problem is, is they don't understand that they should have no self-esteem. That the only esteem that we should have is built upon Jesus Christ. We are sinners who are saved by His grace. Oftentimes, I've heard those words in my office, my child has such poor self-esteem. But in 2 Chronicles 26, 16, it says, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Kings didn't get to do that. That was a priest's job. Uzziah was opposed by 80 priests who warned him that he was stepping over his bounds. But, full of pride, and enraged, Uzziah threatened the priest and was immediately stricken again by God with leprosy, one of God's favorite ways to make his point. God took very serious Uzziah's demonstration of self-confidence. And this king lived the rest of his life separated from everyone in a separate home. This king, who had desired to elevate himself to the position of priest king, lost his throne to his son because he was unable to function as a king. Most of you will remember Haman from the book of Esther, the great foe of the Jewish people, obsessed with his own self-importance after being elevated to a position of prominence in Persian Empire, he became enraged when Mordecai refused to pay him what he determined to be proper homage. To teach Mordecai a lesson, Haman determined to exterminate Mordecai's people, the Jews. That's, this is the, the first attempt to eliminate the Jews. In the end, however, it was Haman who perished as he was hung on the very gallows that were built, that were intended to hang Mordecai. A prideful man. A man who had received a position of prominence and allowed it to go to his head. My last Old Testament reference to the pride of man will be one of the proudest. King Nebu, Kenazar, the king of the mighty Babylonian Empire, in Daniel 4.30, it tells us that King spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and 
for the honor of my majesty. Sounds like he's enamored with himself. Almost immediately. No, take away the word almost. Immediately. In, in verses 31 and 32, it tells us, it says, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, telling him, To you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and, it gives, and He gives it to whomever He chooses. An indication that God does, in fact, oversee all governments of the world. All of these stories have one thing in common, man's pride. In their ultimate downfall because of their pride. Pride seems to be a serious matter with God. Turning to the New Testament, in Acts 12, in the 22nd verse, but Pompus, King Herod Agrippa, decided to hold a celebration, during which the king gave a great speech. And, because his subjects were so enthralled by him, and so scared of him, the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man, over and over. <coughs> During his speech, I imagine as his speech ended. The voice of a god and not of a man. Herod refused to give credit to God. And verse 23 tells us, Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. Wow, that's pretty uh, serious. The Gospels are full of a description of a group of boastful men that desired preeminence in all things, namely the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus speaks of these men in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 5 through 7. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They make, you know, they, they have phylacteries on their fit, on their foreheads. Some may have them on their, their wrists. They, they make the borders of their garments wider so that as they walk by you in a crowd of people, can't help but brush against them. They want, they want to be noticed in all things. They continue. They love the best places at feasts. In other words, they sit in the seats of preeminence. The best seats in the synagogues. They sit in the front, although if they go to the Baptist synagogue, they sit in the back. So that's the best seats in the Baptist. They, 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 they give great greetings in the marketplace, and they love to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, teacher, teacher. When you say it twice, it doubles the meaning of its importance. These were, and today there still are those that justify themselves in the sight of men, as Luke says in 16, 15. Further on in Luke, in 2047, he says, These are those who, for a pretense, make long prayers. These, Luke says, will receive greater condemnation. An indication that there is a degree of condemnation. Just as there are rewards, you better know there's degrees of condemnation. Pride was even an issue amongst our Savior's own disciples. We know that from Matthew 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons 
came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. I think the boys put her up to her. And she was a very influential woman, woman in the church. She supported them uh, financially, gave them food, etc. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, Jesus, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. John, that is the sons of Jezebel, uh, James and John, used their presumed influence with Jesus to ask, ask for preferential treatment in the kingdom. So Jesus, who often does, answers a question and talks about something entirely different, what he wants to talk about. So he uses the occasion, since they are exhibiting pride, he uses the occasion to speak about humility verses 25 through 28. But Jesus called, but Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. In other words, they 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 almost they uh, they hold them down with their ruling. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So that is, for lack of a better phrase, the hall of shame. You know, let me be perfectly honest with you, I can empathize with some of these folks. I know of their desires. I've seen them in my own heart. I know of their ambitions. I feel as if pride is always just around the corner. Pride always seeks to trip us up and bring us down. It's something that's written a lot about in the Bible, and thus I believe it's something that we need to be on guard for. We will begin now in 3 John, in the ninth verse, we have a new person introduced. His name is Diotrephes, and Diotrephes, as with those in the Hall of Shame, the man who sought preeminence. In the first eight verses of 3 John, there has been praise for Gaius for showing hospitality for missionaries who came to his church. Now John will change and begin a sharp rebuke for Diotrephes for refusing to show hospitality to the servants of the gospel in for actually permitting others to show hospitality to the servants of the gospel. The Apostle John exposes Diotrephes' personal ambition, his perverted actions, and he offers up another man, Demetrius, as a commendable contrast to him. So next week, we will return to 3 John in the ninth verse. Thoughts on pride? Anyone? No one?
because it's not my children. My children. We used to, I used to have great battles at the, the Christian schools when I had principals that would refer to it as my school. That was verboten in my office. You could not say my school. Not your school. Scott's school. And if we, if you, if you use your words and utter them in a way that expresses humility, humility has a way of permeating you. It's a desired trait. God desires that His people be humble. He wants them to live humble lives. But when our words speak otherwise, it's hard for us to live a life of humility. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Jim. You know, it's, it's, it's I can really, really do a number on it. Some of us uh, like like we are over here, you know. And there's things I want to do that it comes out of my mouth. Oh yeah, I'll do that. You know, like Mike and I were talking the other day about this. I got no problem. still has a way to use you. Yeah. And he still has a plan for you. He does, and I'm slow to accept it, but I'm beginning to accept it. I can tell you are. <laughs> because you profess it. Yeah. And you keep professing it. And it, it'll be easier to accept it. Yeah. You know the easiest yeah. thing? They gave me a handicap. Yeah, that's the only time I don't have any pride, man. I'll, I'll us them that handicap. I have a Becoming envious, which is another thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the greatest desires of my heart. I have a handicap parking permit. <laughs> so I can get close to the store. Do you want to use mine this week? Yeah. Careful what you wish. Yeah, really. Right. <laughs> Yeah. 
tell somebody I'm grateful. Yeah. I was coming about about 18 months ago. I, yeah. I wondered what I'm going to do. Uh, anything else? Anybody? We have a couple of things that we should acknowledge. The Russia's marriage of 49 years. Wow. Wow. Well, I figured since, what, wow. they're 55. They were married when they were sick. <laughs> a little young. But, and uh, I think we had somebody that had a significant birthday. So I was, I, I've been asked to, uh, to sing a special. Here we go. Birthday rendition for, for Jerry, who's, who's, turned, who's turned 55, correct, Jerry? That was yesterday, I think? Okay. So, this is, this is a special birthday rendition just for Jerry. And I only sing this to you once in your life, so and you'll see why. Happy birthday. Yes. Happy birthday. One more step closer to death. But happy birthday, people living in despair, people dying everywhere. But happy birthday. Yes, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Jerry. Let's all stand.